Well, yeah, getting right into this thing, would you be able to give us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and really anything else that you want to get into? And yeah, we can work from that. Absolutely, yeah. Who am I? That's a very difficult question to answer. It's a question of questions. <laughs> question of questions. Um, who am I? Uh, body, mind that identifies with the word or the name Leo. Um, yeah, just been on the spiritual seeking path since I was, you could say, 21, 21. Yeah, around 2021. And uh, yeah, just experienced a lot of suffering and discomfort in my in my younger years, and um, just had multiple different ego deaths within the course of like I don't know, I guess you could say five six years, and um, yeah, most of which occurred through health issues, and um, you know, making a lot of money and losing a lot of money multiple times, and uh, and then finally had a like a, an awakening at the end of last year. And so, yeah, right now I'm just here, just present, just uh, floating and just honoring the present moment wherever it takes me. That's it. Yeah. So how would you describe the indescribable? You know, what you woke up to or maybe what you woke up from, you know, mm. how would you explain what this, uh, what you saw or what you realized? Mm. How would I describe it? Man. <laughs> uh, death. Death is literally the the word that comes up. Mm. It's like um, everything that I knew about life uh, was never the same thereafter. It was just gone. It was yeah. empty, finished. Um, yeah, that's the most simple way to describe it, I would say. Mm. Yeah. You ever heard the Buddhist adage, you have to die before you die and then you can truly live? I haven't actually heard it. But it makes sense. Yeah, right. I feel as though that's the essence of the whole thing is you have to let go of who you thought you were to come into who you really are or yeah. who you're really not. <laughs> yeah, it's like the realization that there was endless seeking, you know, like I didn't feel good enough as I was. And that was my whole life, just trying to seek approval, trying to get things outside of myself. And then when this uh, death occurs, it's like you, there's a contentness with what is. It's just I am as I am. There's no more seeking. It's just, you're just at peace. Um, and don't get me wrong. It's like you still have a body and a mind that has conditionings and trauma and things. And so there's like a process of integration. There's a process of like reparenting yourself as well. It's mm. not like everything is perfect right after that. But um, to a great extent, there is a huge amount of uh, peace. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Now, how would you describe where that peace comes from? Because to the mind, to the layman, maybe that doesn't know any better, they hear death and peace. It's like, wait, what? It doesn't compute. You know, everyone's scared of dying. So how is this ego death process um, the pathway to peace? Mm -hmm. <sighs> the process of dying can be a very discomfort, uh, uncomfortable process um it's like the uh the ego wants to cling on to stability it wants to cling on to identity it wants to cling on to meaning but uh and so it's almost like kicking and screaming as it goes through this death process yeah. but once the death occurs it's like uh, there's like an emptiness that you land on it's just like oh everything is fine there it's it's yeah there's no um there's no agenda there's just, uh, it's just simple. There's no direction. There's, it's, it's just this right here, right now. It's very difficult to explain. It's difficult to put into words. Really is, man. Yeah. It's sort of a joke of why we come on here and do this stuff. We try to put it into words, but I can't help it. There's just something yeah. in me that's like, I got to try and talk about this or at least point to it, even though there's no way that I could mix up my words to truly ever pinpoint this essence this wavelength that we speak upon so it's sort yeah. of ironic in that way it's like everyone has different ways of expressing it as well and it's like every mm. person expresses a fractal of it mm. and every fractal just makes this one uh i guess you could say explanation of it but yeah words there's only so yeah. much words can do as well yeah I like that i got like an image of 
a mandala. It's a beautiful mandala. That we, That's what you're creating here, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> Every conversation that you have with these people is just a <laughs> fractal of the man mandala. Yeah, right? Sometimes I see it also as like a mycelial network. Mm. Right? It's just like yeah. a giant network. Each person is like a node. Some more uh, have more connections than others, but either way, I guess they're all connected centrally to me in some way, mm. but it's all, it's all one network. But yeah, Mandala Network, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey. Well, we're all yeah. capable of doing that. We're all capable of creating our own mycelial network in that way, in the Mandala of God, you could say. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Do you ever say the G word of God? Do you describe it in a godly sense or do you shoo away from that? Uh, God played a huge role in this awakening, actually. Um, last year, there was a lot of suffering. There was a lot of suffering. It's like it was the peak of all suffering. It's like every year, yeah. like a year, a year would pass and it was like, this is going to be the last year. Like uh, there's going to be no more suffering after this year. It was like this hope that I would cling on to. Um, but each year would intensify. <laughs> I was like, where am I going? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, last year there was a, I mean, the diagnosis that I got formally was borderline personality disorder. Um, so three, four years ago, I, ha I had bipolar disorder. So there was like swinging from mania to depression, mania to oh. depression. Um, and then I remember I would take psychedelics and I used to do all these different things to try to heal myself. And I remember one bad psychedelic trip messed me up and I got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder after that. And so there was this swinging of emotions of like joy to depression, to love, to anger and it would happen 20 30 40 times in a day it almost became impossible for me to hold a normal conversation with someone and so coming back to god there was this all i would do is pray you know and pray for guidance from god and at the same time my physical body as well i, I had multiple traumatic brain injuries from concussions i had chronic fatigue syndrome i had um kidney like there was all kinds of problems that were going on my physical body just from living a very chaotic life and so my my final string and hope was god mm. and so there would be moments where i would just sit in my room prior to awakening and it's like i would just feel god's love it was like this unconditional blissful love that would just absorb me and and I, it's like there's nothing to achieve or to get in the material world when you feel that love of god it's like uh this abundant energy <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. and um, there was a moment where I started to cultivate this relationship with God and I would ask God to give me answers like God what am I meant to do now where am I meant to go and God would answer me through bliss and so it's like the answer was yes I would receive this hit of bliss and it wow. would just basically penetrate my entire being and I'd be like okay that's the answer and I'd honor that and so sometimes oh, yeah. I'd ask God, like, okay, where am I meant to go next? Where am I meant to travel? And then I'd travel to a specific location following this bliss, and then some miracle would happen. <laughs> mm. And so it's like I was just following the breadcrumb breadcrumbs of bliss for many, many months. Um, but there was still a deep suffering that was occurring despite the connection to God. And um, I remember one day I just prayed. I said, God, I don't want to be here anymore, and I'm done with this life. Please end it in the most peaceful way that you can. And God had told me that there was another path that I could um, liberate my soul. I could attain enlightenment was the way that I had understood it in that moment. And so I said, God, guide me Where, wherever you, you're meant to take me. I surrender to you. And um, yeah, and I remember God had communicated to me that uh, a mentor would come into my life and uh, like a teacher. And I remember three days later, I was just sitting, uh, you know, I was just waiting to see what would arrive and what would come into my field. And one of my old friends, one of my old mentors when I was 19 years old, calls me out of the blue. And he's like, yo, Leo, I just came out of jail. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> and he's like, come meet me in Norway. And he starts speaking and he's saying all these things. He's, he's basically speaking, but nothing that he was saying was making sense. It was like he'd attained this high spiritual wisdom in the jail cell, but he wasn't able mm. to communicate it in normal physical form. And I was like, this guy makes no sense. I, I, I was concerned about him, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And um, so I ended the call. He calls me back the next day. And for once, I decided to just sit and I decided to meditate in the call rather than try to understand logically what he was saying. And then all of a sudden, I feel this bliss energy. It's like God's love just consume me again. And I was like, wow, like there's something here. I think I'm meant to meet this guy. And so I ended up meeting this guy in, in Norway. And uh, he would basically just laugh to himself like all day. He was like crazy. He would just <laughs> laugh to himself. And, and then sometimes he would just sit around in silence. And he was a very interesting character to observe. And um, we ended up actually going into the nightclubs together. That's what we used to do back in the day. He used to teach me about social skills and how to communicate and meet women by going to the nightclubs. And so that's what we did. We basically just went to the nightclubs every night. And I would observe him from the distance and I would see him kind of just like consumed in his own energy. There was no, like he wasn't trying to get anything from anyone. Yeah. And all night people were coming up to him and trying to buy drinks for him and asking him questions. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? How is he doing? Like, why is this happening? And so, yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, me spending time with him taught me about the power of sovereignty returning to myself. It's like no longer seeking anything outside of myself. I'm not mm -hmm. seeking women. I'm not seeking money. I'm not seeking anything, really. I'm just here in this moment. Um, but yeah, long story short, uh, he was the one that actually guided me into this whole awakening process. Um, and, and it's like God was guiding me to these different people. Uh, so God, yeah, played a big role in this whole process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Still does. Follow your bliss. Follow Powerful. your bliss. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think that's really where this path leads to is ultimate surrender to God. And then once you do that, uh, God guides. If you allow it to, if you allow the Holy Spirit to take over, God will guide you in the decisions that you make become so apparent if it's right or if it's wrong you know it seemed to be very strong in your being and i feel it as well it's just like um strong it's subtle it's also subtle but strong at the same time hard to explain this resonance of things and uh decisions that need to be made or in judgment that enters my being it's just like a it's an apparent yes or apparent no this intuitive guidance that comes um from ultimate surrender and uh yeah man that's priceless like once you find that it's like uh i was gonna say easy mode but it's not really easy but it is definitely simpler it's simpler living if you know how to follow that uh the guidance from the divine that's only if you surrender to it because mm -hmm. the, the i still have a mind and body and, and there's an ego that's still present that surfaces occasionally and um you know we need an ego to function and so there are going to be moments when you feel like you need to be doing something that makes logical sense, yeah. but on a God level makes no sense whatsoever. It's like, even when I gave away my business, I had a multiple seven figure business. God told me to give it away on a logical level made no sense whatsoever, you know, but it's like, uh, just that surrender, you know, the surrender into uncertainty. It's um, so the, there can be a battle between the ego and God's truth as well. Yeah, I think that's the story of humanity. It's the battle that we have within and what to listen to, mm. right? It's the battle of uh, the Bible pretty much is like we're rebelling against God. That's the story of ages old. And it's really what do you want to listen to? How much do you want to surrender? And uh, we haven't quite got there yet into full surrender, but that's just part of the process. That's just part of the journey. I think also with this realization comes uh, forgiveness too. Do you feel that like, even though you do maybe um, you fall fall into sin, as we all do, uh, do you feel as though it's, uh, I was going to say easier to sin, but it's like you're more forgiving of yourself when you, when you mess up per se, because you recognize it's not really a mess up, right? Mm. But from one angle, it's not exactly surrender. You know what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... I think what we do, human beings judge themselves, shame themselves all the time, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that just comes from the lens of like how we were raised as parents. Like we, we essentially become our own parents. Yeah. We just judge and shame ourselves when we do something that we deem as wrong. Um, but I think that the highest path is really just self-compassion in all moments, unconditional to what 
happens. Mm. It's like no matter what you're experiencing moment to moment, maybe you feel some anger, some sadness, or maybe you broke your streak in NoFap, or maybe whatever you did, it's like, are you going to judge and shame yourself? Or are you just going to watch yourself and just be like, wow, I, I, I give you compassion. I love you as you are. It's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when yeah. you do that, there's a, you just build a healthier relationship with yourself. There's less of a desire to do these acts even. Mm -hmm. mm, exactly. Yeah. I feel that. There's less of a desire to do the acts of sin per se. Uh, but yet, there's still some scars. There's still almost like residual karma and stuff that is like latent in our mind and our brain from conditioning from past lives. Who knows? Whatever it is. But it's our desires are in there. And I think it's worse if you repress them, actually. I think it's a, uh, is it Carl Jung or is it Freud? He has, the uh, yeah, the shadow. And if you repress that, the shadow comes out in very destructive ways. Absolutely. So you kind of have to, uh, you have to work with the devil a little bit sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that you saying this as well, because um, it's like a lot of people in this spiritual community or new age spiritual community, they focus on love and light. It's like the thing, oh, love and light. But you can, and there's a lot of people that you can feel there's an element of bypass. You're just avoiding life. Yeah. You're avoiding truth. Mm -hmm. um, it out of fear, really. It's like, I remember there was a time when I used to go to these Joe Dispenza retreats. And Dr. Joe would say, oh, you have to be in a state of love to mani manifest your dreams, manifest your desires. And so everyone is walking around just like trying to be happy and in love all the time. And it's like, are you really being authentic? You know, have you really gone deep into your own shadow? Or are you just playing a game? Are you just running around with a mask? And so it's very easy to bypass. And often it's the most traumatized individuals that end up in these spaces. They're the ones that are running away from their shadow. They're the ones that are running away from the pain because it's difficult. It's not an easy process. It takes courage mm -hmm. to go into your shadow. Yeah, courage for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's not the easiest route per se, but um, it's the most worthwhile route. It's virtuous and noble. You know, you could probably attest, I know you attest to it, that the Leo now, compared to the Leo, say, I don't know, five, ten years ago, is probably a completely different being and also maybe purer. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But you probably have refined yourself to become a completely different expression of Leo, right? Absolutely. I think Leo changes every day, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it, too, is going with the flow of change and not constricting yourself to an identity of who you should be. What's that Alan Watts quote? It's like, you have no obligation to be the person you were five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. That's the essence. Yeah. Yeah. Go with the flow. You just got to go with the flow, man. Follow your bliss. Go with the flow and forgive. Yeah. And then that, that refinement of character just becomes natural. That refinement of who you think you should be, it's not even there. Like there's no thinking you should be anybody or anything because you are nobody or anything. Mm. You just live freely as nobody. And mm. That's the beauty of it. You, I'm nobody. I mean, we're still, the show goes on. I'm still playing the character of Gary and Leo and the listener is still them, but there's like, there's no strings attached to mm. how the character plays out its role. That's freedom, mm. man. That is freedom. Yeah, the game becomes a whole lot more fun. It's like you can play That's different it. characters without attachment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's all about, right? Truly enjoying this experience, right? I think contrary to popular belief, we're actually supposed to enjoy it here. And uh, one may say, well, the Buddha says life is suffering. What are you talking about, Gary? I think it's, yes, I agree with that. But it's to, hmm, it's almost like you learn how to enjoy your suffering. And it's not in a masochistic way, mm -hmm. but it's like you learn how to work with it. You go with the flow. Um, Swami Muktananda has another saying. It's, uh, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So learning how to surf is how you have fun. <laughs> and the waves are going to crash anyway, so you might as well learn how to surf. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. You might as well start to work with your darkness in order to uh, have fun. Like we said, enjoy this experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And I hope that doesn't sound like bypassing because it's not, it's, uh, it's definitely not bypassing. It's just like, uh, it's just 
just learning how to deal with the the circumstances and karma of our life a little bit differently. You know? Yeah. That's the process, man. But it's all comes from devotion. Getting back to it. It all comes from surrender, I feel. It all comes from just like letting your hands off the steel letting your hands off the steering wheel a little bit and saying, I'm done. God take over and then from there that's where the uh the surfing lessons commence <laughs> yeah yeah man let me ask you this one uh because you have an interesting story from what i know the little bit i know about you you made a lot of money in the past right you were an entrepreneur or a businessman marketing whatever and then you kind of gave it up and got into this realm can you give us a little bit about that and why you know money wasn't it yeah um so money was always a desire of mine since i was 13 14. i always tried to find like creative ways of making money in my bedroom like i used to play like games like runescape i don't know if you're familiar with that of course oh yeah and mm -hmm. um i remember i would always try to make money in the game instead of level up my skills like i was mm. just chasing the money <laughs> and then there was a time when i found out i could actually sell in-game currency for real life money <laughs> and then that's when everything shifted and i was like uh -huh. okay i'm gonna put business in here and so I built my own exchange, uh, currency exchange server uh, within the RuneScape wow. platform and started <laughs> making thousands of dollars when I was like 16, 15, 16 years old. That's actually impressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are people and, still doing that? Like RuneScape is still a game, right? And are people still making legitimate money off of that? People are still making legitimate money. Probably not as much as what it was back in the day, but yeah. I think we're still doing it. Um, um, but yeah, so I guess there was always this desire for it from a young age. There was always like a, almost like an inherent skill. Like, you know, I feel like every soul has a certain skill set that they incarnate with or like a certain yeah. thing they're meant to do. Mm. That just happened to be the skill set of Leo. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, and then obviously I ended up losing a lot of money. Like for, it was 46 Bitcoins when I was 17 years old. Wow. At that time it was equivalent to around $30,000. Um, mm -hmm. Today, that'll be over $3 million, which is mm -hmm. you know, quite a fair amount. Um, but I lost that when I was 17 years old. I fell into depression and I started doing a lot of drugs. I spent time with homeless people. I slept in train stations. I did any anything and everything I possibly could to run away from feeling what I, was, I didn't want to feel, like the, the, the sadness of losing everything that I had made. And then um, I went really deep down that rabbit hole and... Somewhere, uh, my, my friend had almost overdosed from drugs one night. And I remember police had raided this warehouse that we were all doing drugs in. It was a very intense, dark situation. And um, I pr made a promise to myself. It was like, I will never touch this stuff ever again. And so I remember going home. And the first thing that I did was typed in how to make money online. And so I went back into that whole thing again. And so, yeah, from there, I learned how to grow Instagram profiles. I, I, I really was fascinated by psychology. I was mm -hmm. fascinated about how do you like influence a certain person to uh, follow or buy a certain product? I was like, I, I want to understand people. Mm -hmm. And so I used my understanding of psychology in, uh, to um, build profiles on Instagram. And, you know, people started paying me money for it. Within a year of doing it or eight months, I was invited to meet a guy called Ty Lopez, if you're familiar with him. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, everything just kind of blew up and uh, started, uh, you know, traveling the world. And just I built a team of 27 people at its peak, spoke on stage with a guy called Russell Brunson, if you're familiar with him, marketing guy. No. And um, but yeah, basically just immersed myself in the marketing world and um, made several millions of dollars in that process so you were uh, living the dream quote unquote whatever that means yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh so why did you decide to wake up from the dream you know what was what was the money and all the experiences not doing for you that uh led you to this point of exhaustion it's funny because i was gonna make a, a youtube video yesterday um and i was gonna the headline was gonna be trauma made me a millionaire <laughs> that's a good one yeah and um i realized that i was just running and chasing something constantly i was i didn't feel good enough as i was and so i would network with millionaires and billionaires and i would put a mask on to try to win them over and try to get their validation and their approval it's like i, I just didn't feel good enough as i was and so 
all my millions was built from a level of inauthenticity as well <laughs> you could say um and so yeah there was a a deep amount of stress i was working for 13 14 plus hours every single day and uh it led to burnout you know like uh, it led to physical health issues as well you know and so all of that had kind of made me realize that I was, there was nothing really here, you know, and every time I made money, I would spend it as well. It's like I was using my money for seeking. Mm -hmm. I would hire new mentors all the time as a way of looking for someone to save me. You know, oh, I spent yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars on mentors and teachers, ridiculous, you know, and <laughs> masterminds, coaching, whatever else I was doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Again, when when the awakening to no self or the non dual realization occurred, there was like, what? Where is there is nothing to seek? It's all here, you mm -hmm. know. Like I don't really need all of this material stuff that I've been chasing. Yeah. Wow. So it's like the more you sought after the stuff, the material stuff, the more you would want the material stuff. Like the more seeking that you um, enabled yourself to do, the more seeking would come from that. Yeah, it was just never-ending seeking. That's all it really yeah. was. It was just trying to fill this wound, this void of just being a small boy. Yeah. Looking for love. Validation. Yeah, love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And so it's like my image of like successful people changed a lot as well. Like, what does it mean to be successful? Well, it just means maybe you didn't get love from your parents and so you chased your entire life to try to get this thing outside of yourself you know mm. um that's powerful it's a powerful testament that i think is important to get out there because most people's um pursuit the highest pursuit in our lives is get as much money as you can as quick as you can understandably so you know to be able to feed your kids have a roof over your head and the basic comforts of life but i think um Money has a limit to what it can provide. And then um, people like you, it's important to show the limit and how it's like, it's not all it's cracked up to be, right? But if you don't have the money, if you never get it, then you'll never understand the futility in the pursuit of it. So it's almost like everyone's on this hamster wheel and they never are able to get off because they never realize they're on a hamster wheel in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> in the pursuit of getting it. So I think it's important for people like you to speak like that. And I think um, there's a famous Jim Carrey quote, paraphrasing, it goes like, I wish everybody could get rich and famous so they can realize that it's not about getting rich and famous. <clears throat> right? He realized yes. that he had a big awakening a few years ago. Yes. And uh, yeah, I don't know. There's something special about that when people have a lot of money and they come to see this stuff and this non-dual realization, self-realization, they realize what life is really all about in a way. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just praising you and your story and your uh, courage to be vulnerable and, and talk about this stuff on here, man. It's, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I do want to say though, like uh, we shouldn't make the pursuit of money or fame wrong. That's another thing that I'm realizing. That's true too. Yeah. If mm -hmm. it wasn't for that pursuit, I wouldn't have realized what I've realized, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's all meant to be. Yeah. In some way it's very true. Yeah. So it's nothing wrong with it, but I think it's like when we think that is, the pinnacle and that is it that's not it and you're you probably you know you still pursue money in some way obviously right you still work you still you don't want to be poor that's obviously the, that's that's the funny thing as well it's like i remember after i gave away my company six months later i had 20 dollars left in my bank account mm -hmm. and i made a video about this and posted it on my instagram i was like the, i was like basically dissolving the identity that i created of being a, a successful entrepreneur i was like i have nothing now. i have no money Mm. um and yeah and then for some months i was kind of like god was providing like mo money would just show up that would allow for me to do basic things and eat and whatever else yeah but then i realized there was a shadow that was created it was almost like a hatred of money and <laughs> that arose oh yeah so that became like, an attachment yeah it's like i'm a renunciant yeah. i don't like money i don't want money and i'll push it away <laughs> but yeah. money isn't good or bad it's literally just energy it's a tool in the same way that a knife isn't good or bad a knife can be used to kill someone it can also be used to cut your food right mm -hmm. and so it's like we don't want to 
we want to be very conscious of the stories that we put on money, right? Like what, what are we putting onto? What are we projecting onto it? When we realize money is just energy, there, there is no good or bad. We just use it for what it is, you know, mm. it's just energy. Yeah. Just energy, man. Yeah. Very well said. It's a double-edged sword. Um, something I see with a lot of ardent Buddhists is the attachment to being unattached, you know? And, uh, if you follow that, it's definitely a noble and virtuous pursuit, but it will also lead to suffering. So it's good that you also, you realize that it's like, I can't be, I can't be attached to being unattached to money <laughs> or experience or anything really. Um, so yeah, it's the middle way. Truly the middle way is being able to go with the flow of whatever from that surrender, from that ultimate surrender to God. Yeah, man. But it's like if you don't know, it's hard to, it's like if you don't go through it, it's hard to really realize that, you know, we, we're conditioned so much. Our, the Western world is insane when it comes to material pursuits. It's so hard to break out of that shell and realize that's not it. You have to, in a way, learn from experience, it seems, or else you're not going to get the message. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but it seems like you kind of have to. I think in a, in a way, we all learn from experience, all of our own experiences. And the big dawning from people like you, I spoke to a lot of other people that have had money, and you come to realize it's like, it only goes so far, right? It only, it only provides so much. Really, you don't need anything. Truly, you don't need anything. But at the same time, um, don't be attached to that ideal. It's, it's, a, it's a paradox, you mm -hmm. know? It's, it's truly a paradox and it's hard to convey with words, but it's the middle way is just complete fluidity in what God provides for you. And mm -hmm. you deal with that. If God wants you to be a billionaire, you go with that. If God wants you to be a homeless person, you go with that. Either mm -hmm. way, you follow that bliss as you spoke of before. And that'll just lead you to the the easiest or simplest route in the expression of your uh of your of your humanness <laughs> mm. of uh who you are to the least amount of suffering i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah man it's the middle way right uh the buddha went out into the woods became enlightened followed the perfect ascetic path right fasted yada yada and then he said, wait a second, this ain't it. I got to come back into the kingdom and teach. I got to go back into the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Essentially, I think that is the path of all sages. It's like you, there is a point of monk mode, right? There's a point of detachment. But then we realize that detachment isn't the end of the journey per se. There's a little bit more to it. And I mm -hmm. find it's like a sense of giving back, right? Do you feel as though like there's something that inclined you to give back? It's so interesting that you say that. Well, firstly, it's like one thing I'm realizing is like a dance between detachment and attachment. Yeah. It's so easy to just be detached from life and just be, oh, everything is okay. Everything is fine. That can also become bypass, you know? Mm -hmm. And there can be some value to being attached to things, some value to it. And so we don't want to avoid the, the perfect humanness of just like engaging with life and enjoying duality enjoying attachment enjoying desires and pleasures yeah. you know yeah um perfect humanness it's a good way to put it perfect humanness um your question slipped out of my mind though remind me of what you just said do you feel uh do you feel in the essence of the sage is to not be completely living in a cave in some way you got to come back into the world to give back uh a little bit of what you realize, maybe guide people or just, I don't know, do whatever you do to give back on this wavelength. It's so interesting because prior to awakening, there was a stronger desire to serve people than after awakening. Mm -hmm. It's almost mm -hmm. like there was a, yeah. there was actually like a, I wouldn't say like a, what do you call it, like Messiah complex in a way. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to become the next Messiah and I'm going to change the world and save the world. That was like really what I was running on. <laughs> that was like what gave me purpose. But that was also a wounded boy <laughs> that was mm -hmm. just uh, trying to chase validation and wanting to save people. Um, And there was a genuine love for people as well, like a genuine love of like, oh, I want to really help people. Um, And then this, this awakening happened and it's almost like 
I realized that um, a lot of like the egoic desire to help people had just dissolved. And so I like, I just honored where people's process was. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone's going through whatever they're meant to be going through. I don't need to save them, you know? Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, my body and mind has decided to start a YouTube channel and decided to help the people in my social circle. And it's like people are benefiting as a result of being in my field and as a result of me just doing things. Yeah. But there's no real like agenda behind it. There's no ego pursuit behind it. There's no like, oh, I need to be this particular way or reach a certain amount of fame or whatever. It's just, no, it's just happening. You know? Yeah. Just like an offering, no conditions, throwing it out there type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that too. I also went through the Messiah complex and I would try to tell people about this in my regular life that weren't necessarily uh, on this wavelength. I would try to like talk how we're talking now, just so out of context. And they would just look at me funny and they'd be like, Gary, are you okay? <laughs> hmm. You know, it just, it just wouldn't compute. It wasn't the right time. I was trying to save them, as you said, hmm. and you can't save anybody. No one can save anybody. That's the thing. You can try all you want. You can talk all the wisdom you want, but if they're not if they're not with it they're not with it and that's okay that's part of everybody's karma so i think the big difference between the messiah complex person and the just throwing it out there person is less attachment to um results or less attachment to how this how i'm perceived by how i speak it's sort of just like take what you want if you don't want it that's okay i don't need to be looked at as the messiah Right. I don't even think I'm doing it for that reason. And if you do it for that reason, then people are going to look at you in an authentic manner. That's the thing, too. It's like literally just having a good time. Right. Like you I'm just kind of like getting some stuff off my chest. Do you feel that when you uh, started a YouTube channel, you just like, I don't know, I'm just kind of doing this almost like as a journaling experiment or there's just something that wants to be shared that isn't even attached to Leo. There's just something that's just working through you. That's literally all it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, there's, there's no attachment to needing to change people. That was a good thing that came up when I heard you speaking. Mm -hmm. It's like any desire to change people is coming from, oh, I'm above you. And so you're not good enough as you are. And so I'm yeah. going to try to change you to fit my vision of how a perfect human is. Like, what is that? No. <laughs> this, That's this. big ego right there. <laughs> Under the guise of no ego. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yeah, I, I can only talk about it cause I went through it and I just cringe at the previous Gary that used to do that. Try to wake people up per se in my personal life. It's like, Oh dude, if you only knew better, if you only knew. And essentially it's because I was still suffering, you know, I was still suffering and I was almost like projecting that on other people in my life, trying to wake them up. It's some weird psychology, but it wasn't, it wasn't doing anybody good. <laughs> Moral of the story. It wasn't doing me good. It wasn't doing the other people good either. So yeah, nobody likes uh nobody likes the false messiah, false prophets in that way. An even jealous evangelicalist, is that what they're called? An evangelical person. Nobody likes that. Mm. Yeah, man. <sighs> I think as we spoke of in the beginning though, this is some some sort of irony. Because we come on here to speak. We're almost like clowns, <laughs> gestures in some kind of way, doing this for apparent no reason. I don't know. It's like we're just kind of just having some fun. <laughs> like I really don't care how many views I get. I don't care who sees this. I don't care what people say. I just do it just to do it, man. It's mm. so beautiful to be able to create from that point because you know, you definitely know from coming from marketing creation from that point is like you need to get a certain hmm. metric you have to meet a certain uh, statistic on the screen right you need to get a certain amount of views and that's like that's not even real creativity i feel like that's just like it's creativity it definitely is but it's it's not pure right because there's conditions upon it like pure creativity is like you're just letting it flow almost like free writing or you just you got a paintbrush and you're just letting it letting it flow what however that's how i feel when i come on here i'm just, just open just, just letting it flow yeah, yeah just painting yeah. exactly man yeah. this is why i have real moments of like confusion well i wouldn't say confusion but it's like um like in present moment i have a marketing agency and so yeah. i gave away my previous one and i started a new one six months later after i realized that i wanted to make money again and <laughs> um 
yeah and it's like there are moments where i'm like what am i doing you know it's like i'm trying to put agenda into trying to like influence and persuade people to do a certain thing and like meet their pain points and their needs and the de their desires to it's it's weird it's very weird when you look at it from that lens it's part of the game though it's like there's nothing wrong with it as we said before yeah it, 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 you know it is i think the only noble thing that you can do is is be discerning about who you work with oh yeah because yeah. i remember mm. one point way way back in the day i actually used to work with only fans models wow and so okay. actually help only fans models monetize their you know nice their nudes um <laughs> yeah. and then i was like i was like what am i doing how am i benefiting the world with this skill set like just helping <laughs> as jack off as possible wow i feel so good about myself yeah that's <laughs> that's some weird <laughs> energy for sure yeah i would feel strange about that yeah, yeah that's um that might be some dark magic there man but hey, at least you know you're aware of it yeah but anyway <laughs> interesting there, there was a uh, you know now like my intention is to work with people who are have integrity, you know, strong yeah. values and like real benefit that they can bring to the world. Um, and hopefully that's benefiting the collective in some way. Mm, yeah, man. Yeah, it's very true. It's how we use this uh, technology. It's how we express ourselves. The double-edged sword, as we said. What did we mention was a double-edged sword before? Do you remember? It was like um, the essence of like how we use, is it our personality? I don't even know. But for some reason, double-edged sword came to my mind, and it's the technology or in, 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 in the intention behind how we use the technology and how we express ourselves mm -hmm. in, the, in the human form. It really is like, where is this coming from? Where are you working from? Are you working from God or are you working with the devil? It's that simple. In all facets of our life, really, all moments, are you surrendered in your endeavor to God or are you fighting against it and you working with OnlyFans models for guys to jack off, which that might be godly. Who knows? I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm not condemning you. It might be. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation with a guy yesterday. His name is David Dayan Fisher. Uh, he's mm -hmm. actually going to be on my, on my channel tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but he spoke about how the difference between, it's like we make demonic or like devil, uh, like a bad thing. You know, but really it's the mm. it's literally just light and dark. And it's like the light is putting vision on the darkness. It's really just an integration. It's the shadow of the collective. Yeah. This whole demonic agenda that's playing out. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but with um, people speaking about the whole agenda behind this transgender movement and this pedophilic rings that are happening yeah. in elites and all of this stuff. Yeah. Really, it's all um, it's just the collective shadow playing out. And so there's this big uh, battle that's happening between polarities, but I think there is an there is an opportunity. You know, there's no right or wrong really. It's like there is a we're learning how to come to terms with our own consciousness in a way, learning how to yeah. integrate this aspect of ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we're so, coming to terms with the drastic polarities of our consciousness. Yeah, and how to integrate that? Yeah, yeah, man. And uh, I just think we've been. A little off kilter a little off balance like uh the light is starting to come in through the darkness a little more so from the darkness uh we've been caught in the dark for so so long especially the western world we've been caught in the dark and ignorance for so long off balance and uh it was meant to be i think to get to this certain point of evolution as you said like it's kind of like all part of the plan but i think this part of the plan this this point is all of it coming to light that is the meaning of apocalypse. I'm pretty sure it's like to, to shed light. So I think literally like the light is being shed upon all of the darkness we've been living in so we can become anew. If you want to look at it in terms of evolution, like we, we built up so much darkness almost like to hold the light. It was almost like through our, through our ignorance, we built ourselves up to this point of where we're at now. So it could be perfectly um, instituted. So the light in this new wavelength of living could be perfectly instituted from the darkness you know what i mean it's almost like the ignorance is what paved way for us to be able to have the light at this point and have these kind of conversations and awakenings and literally shed light upon ourselves it's like all part of the plan you know and um yeah we're coming to terms with that and and integrating as you said integrating it all and ultimately i think it's just leading toward 
a better world. I think there'll always be the duality of man. There'll always be the yin and the yang and the darkness. But I think, like I said, we're moving toward a more utopic vision in that. Because if not, then uh, I don't know what's really going on here. We're just kind of like caught in limbo. I think ultimately I see a better world coming from the darkness. It might take 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, million years. Who knows? But I think ultimately we're doing this so we can evolve into higher beings, right? Do you feel that? Do you feel as though there is progression, right? I mean, I know we can talk about in an absolute sense, there's nothing going on, right? Mm -hmm. There's no progression. It's all good. It's just all peace. It's all God. I get that. But within the story of humanity, like, do you see something coming from this wavelength that we speak on, like a different wavelength altogether for the collective? Absolutely. Uh, I'm actually a partner in a business called New Earth University. Wow. And so the vision, the the core visionary of that business, um, he, we share this vision that we're building a new earth and our desired outcome is to acquire land and build new earth templates on this land and live in harmony. And so once we build this template, we bring it out to the rest of the world. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like our way of um, supporting the shift, I guess you could say. We also believe that marketing is going to play a huge role in that. Why? Because everyone spends time on their phone scrolling through social media. What are they yeah, putting exactly. in consciousness? Are they mm -hmm. putting things that are in alignment with uh, a positive agenda or a demonic agenda? You know, yeah. and so yeah, I definitely believe that we're heading towards a certain uh, new earth, so to say. But before we get there, there is a crumbling that gets to occur. I actually mm -hmm. believe that. I believe that things have to get worse before they get better. And I do yeah. think they get worse, to be honest. Um, yeah, like in the short term, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I feel that too, but it's ultimately to become a new, almost like a metamorphosis it's a metamorphosis or a collective rebirth. Um, but yeah, it might get a little shaky in the yeah. coming years. Yeah, and if you look at it from a practical lens, there's like a light is being shed on the dark again. It's like more mm -hmm. is being seen, more is being made visible that we wouldn't have known about, you know, 10, 20 years ago yeah. because of social media. So, um, yeah, it's like there's an archetypal torch so just being sh shed on the collective, so to say. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Interesting times. Interesting times. We've, uh, if we've had multiple lives, I like to say, this is it. This is the one. <laughs> this is the lifetime of lifetimes. Uh, and what's that adage? May you be born in interesting times. These are very interesting times, to say the least. And it's really just change. It's a time of change. Great change. Great change. I mean, you could say there's always change. I get that. But change in the story of humanity and the collective and our collective purpose here on Earth, like as a species, as a consciousness, as one conscious agent expressing itself in the multitude. The multitude seems to be shedding light on what our purpose here is on this blue rock, right? And uh, we're just witnessing it. We're seeing it all happen, man. And for people that don't know any better about this wavelength of, you know, self-realization, it can be tough. Like it's, I can, I actually empathize with a lot of people, you know, I don't condemn anybody. I don't look down upon anyone because I realize this great awakening we're talking about, this crumbling, it's tough, man. And we're all going through it at this point. And the only way I feel, the only like sanctuary, the only way you could get through it is to see through it really, is to be able to see through yourself and um, have this dawn, this realization dawn. And then you could just see the crumbling of civilization as just another coming and going, mm -hmm. right? Like we're talking about it so casually, but I'm going to be real with you. I actually think it's, it's coming to fruition. It's not just like, just putting it out there. Ha ha ha. No, man. I think civilization is actually crumbling or you could say changing drastically. And to me, it's kind of like, well, all right, so it goes. <laughs> all right. If that's what God wills, that's what God wills. And um, I do really feel like that's what God wills, man. And uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much suffering we go to go through because ultimately it's bringing us to who we're supposed to be. And uh, that's just what we got to reap, man. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess uh, my point is like the urgency of these times. Interesting times, but I feel a sense of urgency to not only talk about it, but to 
put this into practice and to stay aligned with that because it's only getting more and more intense as every day goes by. So to anybody listening, um, keep going, you know, stay on this wavelength. This is, this is it. Go within, find the sad guru within and just let that guide you through these tumultuous times that we seem to be living in. And, uh, yeah. And then you will find a sense of invulnerability. Do you feel that? Like, Nothing can really harm you. I mean, obviously you get hurt, you stub your toe, you're going to die. But what you really are deep down is invincible, invulnerable, or just, uh, I don't know. This is, how would you describe that? <laughs> yeah, the physical body definitely can be harmed. It can Anything can happen to it. It's going to die at some point for sure. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, like from an awareness lens, from the lens of source is it's you can't do anything to it. it's unshakable it's unmovable it just is yeah it's not necessarily my awareness it's not me it's just you know it's just what is this it um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's like you know from the lens of awareness i can see that the body may experience pain and sadness and whatever else but awareness itself cannot be touched it cannot be it's, it's it can never change really mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's priceless that's priceless. There's no amount of money that could touch that. There's no amount of money that could affect that, that could sway me away from yeah. that. Right. I paid a fair amount to get here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing too, is yeah, we almost, we almost have a debt, a karmic debt to be able to see that. So it's, yeah, we do pay in some way, in some way, in some through regard. Our suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. We pay into our own yeah. suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a debt we built up ourselves, and it might be a little esoteric. I don't know if, how deep you want to go, but the karmic debt is like, it's not because it was some kind of affliction from somewhere else in some sort of esoteric deep way. We did it to ourselves over lifetimes, over millennia. We built up this debt, and it seems to be this point of awakening, these interesting times that we're living, living in, we're paying the debt. We're all paying the debt, right? The... Uh, the debt collector's here <laughs> mm -hmm. and he's knocking at all of our door to pay the debt. Um, yeah, I feel that. But once you pay it, I guess you're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're good in some sense. Yeah. Yeah, man, that might have been a little lofty and out there. I hope uh, everybody kind of got what I was saying there. But um, yeah, good stuff, man. Wow. This is a good talk. We're already 55 minutes in about. I don't even know what to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think ultimately to, to end on a better note, a little brighter note, as I said before, it's all for us and it's all for us to ultimately live in a better world. Maybe in future lifetimes, maybe our children, whatever it is, it's all God is guiding us in this blissful intuition as we spoke of before in each of our own way to become the servants and purveyors of a better world here, a better realm, new earth, as you say, 5D, whatever you want to call it. It's all going toward progress, growth, I feel. And um, I don't think that's an illusion. I don't think that's like my mind telling me that it's some kind of illusion of growth or whatever. It's like, no, I think really what we're doing here is progressing so we don't have to suffer anymore, essentially. That's really what it's about. So we can get out of our own suffering pay our debts and then actually live in heaven some may say the kingdom of heaven but yeah we shall see yeah all that matters is we find the kingdom of heaven within right that's it that's, that's it. it do the work do mm -hmm. the work that's literally what it comes down to you know become yeah. your own parent to become your own lover you know your own mother your own father your own savior yeah. your own savior truthfully return back to sovereignty mm -hmm. and um uh, yeah, that's really the process. Yeah. That's how we save the world. We save ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. <laughs> Do you have any uh, last words for the pod? Anything you want to get off your chest before we stop recording? Um, I feel pretty complete, man. I feel a lot of peace in this moment. Yeah, I feel appreciation. Thank you for having me. Same. And uh, yeah, the work that you're doing, bringing out these voices to speak on, you know, again, the different fractals of the, the mandala. Mm. And um, 
yeah, I trust that supporting people in their own awakening and their own returning back home and supporting in this whole new earth that we speak of. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, thank so. you, man. It's only possible because of people like you. So keep on keeping on. You're an awesome guy. I can tell you're very grounded in this realization. You have a resonance in your voice that I can feel and, and hear. So I wish you all the best. Keep doing your thing. And that's it, man. Peace and love. Thank you, man. And peace and love to the listener as well. Goodbye, y'all.